Call in with your questions 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. Tory MPs are being told to row in behind the Prime Minister after more speculation about a leadership challenge. It's been suggested that Penny Mordaunt could replace Rishi Sunak. Luke Trill is the UK director of the Mooring Common Think Tank and is a former Conservative policy advisor. He's told Ian he's not convinced changing leader will make a difference. Have the public just tuned out at this stage? Can you look at the budget? People liked, look at the polling of individual measures, made not one iota of difference to Labour's poll lead. MPs are voting this evening on amendments to the government's Rwanda bill. There are ten in total, which have been made by the House of Lords. All of them are expected to be voted down. Former US President Barack Obama has been in Downing Street for a surprise meeting with the Prime Minister. We're told it was to discuss his foundation with Rishi Sunak. And Dame Laura Kenny has told LBC she'll have plenty to keep her busy after announcing her retirement from cycling. Earlier, every time everyone said, happy retirement, I'm like, I'm not my dad, I'm not 60. <laughs> um, I've got so many interests that I just haven't had the time to kind of get my teeth stuck into. Britain's most successful female Olympic athlete says she's swapping professional cycling for parenting. In the city, the FTSE 100 is closed down four points at 77.22. The pound buys $1.27 and €1.17. LBC Weather With Ripple Energy Climate action you can be proud of Showers in the far west Moving eastwards tonight Largely dry in the southeast Lows of 7 From Global's newsroom for LBC I'm Josh Bancroft This is LBC From Global Leading Britain's conversation Cross question With Ian Dale Welcome to Monday's Cross Question. I'm Ian Dale. It's three minutes past eight. On the panel tonight, we have Alexander Downer, former Australian Foreign Affairs Minister and High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, and he's now Chair of the Policy Exchange Think Tank. And Jamie McGrath is here, comedian, actor and writer. He's the author of this rather handsome tome. It's called Rinsing Makami's Soul. Rather intriguing title there. Also, Sundar Katwala is here. He's got a book out too, which I didn't know until he just handed it to me. It's called How to Be a Patriot. Why was it Patriot? What's the, is it English and American? I don't know which one it is. Anyway, Why Love of Country Can End Our Very British Culture War. He's also director of the British Future Think Tank, which is an organisation that specialises on looking at identity and immigration issues. Cindy Yu is assistant editor of The Spectator. She doesn't have a book unless she's hiding it from me. Not yet. But she is also host of the Chinese Whispers podcast. So they're here to answer your questions. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. And do watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And I keep forgetting to tell you, you can WhatsApp us now on the same number as you telephone us on. And that's exactly what Robbie and Chelmsford has done. He says, as they sc scrap like rats in a sack to preserve uh, or posture for power, can these Tories honestly suggest that they're putting the country first? Cindy Yu from the Conservative Leaning Spectator magazine. <laughs> I think... I think many of them do think that they're putting the country first, but it might be in a way where they think the Conservative Party is the best for the country and therefore putting the party first also is putting the country first. It's kind of the same logic that the Chinese Communist Party have about their preservation of power in China. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily downplay their, their good intentions. But I think the party is just so, such a wide coalition now after 2019. The leader that they rallied behind in that election is no longer there. We're in fact two leaders on. We might be a third leader on if the weekend briefings are to be believed and so it's a thorough mess and if you talk to conservative mps they're exhausted actually they many of them 62 of them have already said that they want to be stepping down in the next election many more are just tired of the never-ending psychodrama and the problems that are coming up in the country sundar 
Yeah, I think if you're the governing party in an election year, you've meant to govern the country, and obviously you've got your minds on the election as well. But if the only thing you talk about is the election, I think that does send a signal to the public who are already asking, you know, 14 years on, are you a bit tired? What have you got next? So if you're always saying, you know, should we, should we change the leader again? Maybe we change the leader again. Um, I think I think that's a very difficult. Well, they might get the right one in the end. Well, they might. I, I think I think they're bringing up a risk, which you can obviously say in our parliamentary system, you don't necessarily know at an election whether the prime minister. You elect will be the prime minister next year, but the Conservatives almost turned it into one of these sorts of fruit machines. Really, <laughs> once you have the election, will it be Truss? Will it be Boris? Will it be Suella? Would it be Nigel? I, I think you know, in a way, if they did have a new leader, you could, you could, as an opposition party, they, they could deny them standing and say, oh, you know, good to see you this week. Who will it be next week? So I think, I think there are definite risks to them in, in you know, well, you know, they might have lost their suspension of disbelief that Sunak can lead them to a marvellous victory. I think they might need to knuckle down and you know, uh, get their heads down. Alexander Downey, you, you were part of the uh, Liberal Party in Australia, which, from our perspective, is a Conservative Party. Yeah. And you have this marvellous phrase, which we have yet to adopt, called leadership spill. And you've experienced a fair few of those in your time. In fact, I think you took part in um, at least one. Um, I won one and lost one. Uh, <laughs> what can we learn from the Australian experience here? Well, particularly for parties in government, so I differentiate that from parties yeah. in opposition. I don't think leadership changes a much of an issue for parties in opposition. But for parties in government, getting rid of the Prime Minister is toxic. It creates huge division within the party. So the fall of Boris Johnson has led to a lot of ill feeling in the Conservative Party. I mean, some people hated him, some people loved him. He was overthrown. Uh, so there's a, a body of people in the party who resent that, and you've seen all of that in the media. For them now, months away from an election, and I think the election will be in November, December, months away from the election to be talking yet again about changing the leader, it's suicide. They should absolutely not be talking about that. Think of the punters, I always say to politicians. Think of the voters. What do you think they think of a political party months out from an election which is unsure about its leader? Get behind the leader. He's been elected. Get behind him. Um, and encourage the party to do two things. One, make sure they develop polit policies which are a little bit more inspiring than they've been in recent times. And secondly, I mean, I hate to say this, but they need to pile on the opposition. If they want to have any chance of winning or, you know, holding a lot of seats... That's the their complaint. They say Rishi, the opposition. Rishi Sunak is not really a, a politician. He's an administrator. Whereas you look at somebody like Kemi Badenoch or, or Penny Morden, and they know how to attack the opposition because they're, they're the politicians to their core. Yes, I mean, I'd, I think that's a, a fair criticism of Rishi Sunak. He's a manager rather than, if you like, a natural politician. But he needs, nevertheless... He needs, nevertheless, if he wants to do well enough in the election to focus on the opposition. Because, you know, the opposition promises a lot and they say they won't increase taxes. So how is this all going to work? What would the opposition actually do if they became the government? So out there in voter land, people are just thinking, well, the Tories are a rabble and I'm sick of the Tories and all sorts of things have gone wrong under the Tories. We may as well change. Well, what change to what? And what would happen? And so the challenge for the Conservative Party is to come up with slightly more inspiring policies than they have, but secondly, to make sure they launch a huge attack on the opposition. And Jambi, what do you make of all of this? And I mean, look, looking at the question from Robbie, do you, do you see them like rats trying to preserve power or leaving a sinking ship? And the 62 Tory MPs now standing down at the next election. Uh, it's all of both. I think uh, instead of concentrating on listening to the public, because they have listened to no one when it comes to the public, the public are crying for an NHS that works. The public are crying for uh, councils that are funded. The, the public are crying for roads uh, that are, uh, don't have potholes. The public are crying for a uh, police force. Uh, the public is crying for 
everything. They cannot afford their mortgages, they cannot afford to pay for their bills, and all they're thinking is send a poor Rwandan, uh, a poor Syrian guy to Rwanda. It's preposterous. They have not listened to the general public. Uh, it's a lost cause. The horse has already bolted. Uh, they, even if they try to attack uh, Kiastama, I don't think anybody is listening because that horse has already bolted. It's a lost cause, I'm afraid. Do you, Cindy, do you get the feeling that is where a lot of Tory MPs are? They've just given up already? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's very depressing, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they, they've been... This is the 14th year they've been in power. I, I think it, it is a long time. The last few years, especially since Brexit, has been an exhausting time. I think British politics really changed um, in terms of how demanding it is pre and post 2016 um, and things haven't calmed down because we then had a pandemic we're still dealing with economic fallout from that and you know to Alexander's point about Rishi being an administrator you know in some ways he is trying to be the guy who puts the country first he is trying to solve these problems because he's focusing on what he thinks are the priorities but because of that he's not good enough at playing the political game to put his message across and I, I think he is attacking Labour but because the Tories are fighting so much in amongst themselves that takes out all of the oxygen all of the oxygen you know this weekend it could have been about um, whether or not Diane Abbott should be given the whip back has Keir Starmer really controlled the party after Corbyn instead it was about whether or not Penny Morden should be crowned as, as the next leader so it was it's just totally you know it, it's it's an unru <laughs> unruly party at this point one, one thing to remember, Ian, is we don't change our governments very often at general elections, or they change the Prime Minister every five minutes these days. I mean, I am nearly 50, and actually it's happened three times in my lifetime, um, and this would be the fourth This would be the fourth time. But what you've got a government here is it, it might not even turn up and compete in the election. That, that almost sort of happened in 1997. I think this could be the second time when a government almost doesn't contest the election that it's, that it's there to defend its record in. So but Even in 1997... Um, I mean, John Major did fight that election. Mm. I mean, and and people didn't think it was an automatic cheering, or they certainly didn't predict the size of Tony Blair's majority. There, there was a bit of fight about John Major and his government, when, which there just doesn't seem when, to be. With, when when Gordon know. Brown lost, he had a very depressed parliamentary party. They'd had the expenses scandal, and actually they managed to turn it into a hung parliament when everyone yeah. thought they had gone. Mm. So, in a way, the Conservatives really need to get some cohesion together just actually to have a competitive election, show the public some respect that you've got a choice of parties. Because it can, uh, I mean, Alexander, again, talking to the Australian experience, um, I think back to the days of the Hawke and Keating governments, where the, the Liberal Party was in the sort of dire straits then, wondering if it would ever get power back. Yep. Um, how, how, how can they change their, their attitude over the next six months to at least put up a bit of a fight? Well, it, it, it boils down to policies. So it's, it is about thinking of the public and what the public want. Of course, you can't just fund everything. The public know that. I mean, they're not silly. Mm. You can't go around promising to spend um, billions and billions and billions of pounds on this, that and the other. Um, I would have thought for the Conservatives, the challenge would be to tr how to excite the economy through encouraging investment into the economy. It's too late now. Um, so... I mean, it, it is, in, well, I would say it's probably too late, but that is the challenge for them. Um, they should come up with policies, proposals, ideas that will stimulate investment because you're never going to be able to pay for all of the things we've been talking about here today unless you get investment to yield the revenue to do it. Um, and they should be the party of investment. Um, I mean, and everyone said this on this program. Honestly, the infighting is just deplorable. It is hugely irresponsible for Conservative MPs to be going around week briefing the weekend newspapers about changing the leadership. I think that is outrageous, actually, um, that people are doing that. They have to concentrate on trying to win. Well, I, mean, I don't think they will win. I think that's right. But they have to concentrate on at least trying to perform well. Um, and they are my ideas for how they can do it. Well, let's hope someone's listening. Uh, it's 8.15. This is LBC.
18 minutes past eight on LBC. Alexander Downer here, former Australian Foreign Minister, now Chair of Policy Exchange. Sundar Katwala, Director of British Future. Cindy Yu, Assistant Editor of The Spectator. And Njambi McGraw, comedian, actor and writer. Now, you were just telling us in the break about your new book, Rinsing Mukami's Soul. Um, what you were telling us in the break, it, it sounds... Oh, it's obviously a novel... Um, it, it sounds quite a traumatic read. Well, it's, it's actually um, traumatic and it's also quite funny. When I sent the, uh, because I wrote it during the uh, lockdown, um, <laughs> you know, I didn't even know that Roe versus Wade was going to happen in America and everything. So this is about a young girl looking for a safe abortion in Kenya. And um, it, it's uh, it's everything. She lives in a community that's under threat, uh, but she sees life from a very interesting perspective. So it's quite funny, but it's also quite serious and it's based in post-colonial Kenya. And, uh, you know, there's still a lot of uh, insecurities about land, about housing, about everything. Um, so it is her journey trying to reclaim her life. Uh, she's uh, uh, very focused, very studious. She wants to become a geologist. And then this thing happens to her that completely derails her. And she's determined to get back on track. And she decides to actually get revenge uh, from those people that derailed her t- track, basically. Sounds like a fascinating read. <laughs> Alexander's already ordering his copy as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a great book. <laughs> now, let's move on to uh, a different subject. It's a text question from Paul. Is it fair to say that before sending asylum seekers to Rwanda, we ought to check that it's a safe country? Well, uh, MPs are currently voting on changes made in the House of Lords to the government's Rwanda bill, changes which Number 10 argue would water down and ultimately block the plan. Um... Sunda, let's come to you first on this. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of debates about how safe Rwanda is. I suspect, I mean, I've been there, but admittedly not since 2007. Um, It's a country with a a very troubled past, as we all know from from the genocide. But actually, if you compare its economy, compare its standard of living to most of the countries surrounding it, it does comparatively well. Yes, what the what the UK Supreme Court was trying to decide is is it a safe country for this kind of scheme? If you sent an asylum seeker who'd sought asylum in Britain to Rwanda to seek asylum there, would it be within the rules and conventions and so on? And the court said that um, that would be a reasonable scheme if, with a country that was safe, but that Rwanda was falling short of that. And that's why the government has got a new treaty, um, you know, passing a bill, but also passing a bill to say the courts must decide that it's safe whatever whatever the facts are the amendments are very interesting because this 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 policy splits people you know for it deter and control against it because you're compassionate the amendments are actually very very modest because they mainly come from the cross benches in the house of lords so they say things like the court must find rwanda safe unless there is credible evidence to the contrary or the government must produce a plan to show that uh, the treaty has been amended uh, the treaty has been implemented or the you know the the thing should happen once the treaty is in place and um, we, we asked focal data to poll it and actually across the divide party politics for and against the scheme large majorities of the public including conservatives think the amendments are reasonable because they just they say if you're going to make it safe make sure it is safe and that's a slightly different question from the principle of the policy is it right or wrong to do what's going to happen to tonight Rwanda. is that the house of commons is almost certainly going to vote to reject all of these amendments because the conservatives still have a large majority they'll go back to the house of Lords on wednesday and nobody quite knows what they're going to do what the house of Lords will do whether they will stick to their guns or not alexander Well, I think actually what the Supreme Court decided was slightly different. It decided that um, there was uncertainty as to whether in assessing uh, whether people were refugees or not, the um, Rwandan authorities would make the right decision and they might send... They, they didn't think it was likely, but they thought it was possible that the Rwandan authorities could send someone back to uh, danger. Um, so it's not that Rwanda itself was deemed not to be safe. It was a question about the efficiency and e- efficacy of the Rwandan asylum system and the assessment system. So the government is obviously endeavouring to fix that problem up. Um, 
And, and the, the legislation, I assume, will pass through the House of Commons. Obviously, it's the democratically elected House, so um, ultimately, in the name of democracy, that should prevail. Um, and let's see whether it works. And Jambi? I mean, it's so disappointing to see that Rwanda has been dragged into this row. Rwanda has its own trauma. It's not had just one genocide, it's had two major genocides. Uh, they are still traumatized. Most of those people remember when their, their families were hacked to death. Um, this is a country should, that should have been given the opportunity to recover from all the trauma it's had in the past. And yet uh, we are importing, our, you know, the, the British problem because these asylum seekers are the British problem and we are putting it on top of Rwanda, a country that is just emerging from such a horror. Um, and of course, we know the motivation for Rwanda to get involved is because they're being paid a billion pounds or something like that. It's not going to work. Uh, Rwanda is not a safe country. We have a raging war uh, on the borders of Rwanda with, with, with the Congo, and that may very well spill over to uh, back to, to Rwanda. This is not a safe country. We are actually giving asylum to people from Rwanda because of human rights abuses. Uh, I, I I personally, this is just a gimmick. It's not going to work. We've wasted so much money. And I think the government should actually just abandon this whole thing. I know they're not, and this is likely to be law. Uh, but this has been such a waste of, you know, energy, uh, uh, a waste of uh, the country's finances, and also uh, washing your problems on, on a country that can barely stand on its own two legs. Uh, Rwanda was actually thriving, and its um, reputation has been tarnished by involvement with the British politics, because this uh, doesn't involve Rwanda. It's a, a British problem. Asylum seekers are coming here and the reason they're coming here is because they have their colonial ties. They've got the colonial past and this is why they're escaping here. Perhaps maybe we should just confront our past in order to perhaps uh, and also look at the role that, that our foreign, po foreign policy is playing into all of this. But in no, the creation nobody's of forced refugees. Rwanda to come to this arrangement, have money. they? Money. <laughs> well, this is it. When you go to a country and you test them with all that money, they'll say, yeah, we'll do whatever you want us to do yeah give us the money you give us the people we are we'll but, look after but them. britain actually has quite a proud record with regard to rwanda doesn't it i mean we, we, we've given a lot of development aid to rwanda over the last 15 or 20 years um and i think the rwandans feel that we've sort of replaced france as the, their, their main western point Colonizer. of contact <laughs> well no not no it's not I mean, you can't you can't describe it as colonizing can you i mean Listen. Well, the Belgians uh, were actually the colonizers of Rwanda. Yeah. Not the French. No, yeah, well, the no. French were very. And heavily certainly not the French, British. French was always the main language. But, like, it well, isn't any. Uh, the, the Belgian. Belgians. Yes, they've changed the, yeah. the foreign language. Yeah. They, oh, of course, they speak their own languages, but they've changed. Um, English to, is now the, to English, the official second language. And they've joined language. the Commonwealth. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, they've been very taken with the UK. There's no doubt about that. We, least, are, popular, we are popular in some countries. Yeah. <laughs> The thing is, they, the balance they give us of 12 power. points in the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's an imbalance of power. Why can't, uh, you know, Britain has many allies, equal allies like Canada. Uh, Canada actually is looking for people to settle in Canada because, you know, they're always advertising for, for immigrants workers. Why can't we do a deal with Canada so that they can send their refugees to Canada? Uh, there's an imbalance right here with Rwanda. The thing is, uh, with African countries, they still feel they do not have autonomy because like you said Britain gives them aid what do they get in in return for the aid then they have to do what Britain says this is what aid has always been about we'll give you this and if you don't give do what we say then the aid gets cut so there's tie strings attached and Rwanda is not in a position to say no to Britain because of the imbalance of power uh, if we're talking about perhaps maybe taking the, the asylum seekers to Australia maybe <laughs> that might be because Australia is a huge country, huge resources, and still, you know, you've only got 23 million living in people living in Australia. So maybe that could be something that we could explore and leave Rwanda alone to heal from the wounds of colonialism. Wow. Now there's a suggestion, Alexander. Yes, well, Australia runs a tight immigration policy, and if Indeed. you want to um, keep your country stable, and you want to make sure migrants integrate into the country once they come to the country, um, then you need to have a coherent immigration policy, not, so just, take, not, not just take people at random. So in and, that respect... And there's, no, there's absolutely no doubt 
that people smugglers and others are really gaming the refugee convention. We all know that. And in the case of um, the Rwanda solution, these people are coming from France. They're already in France. Um, they're, not, um, and they're not being persecuted in France. Um, they are perfectly safe in France, but they would rather live Have in the UK. Have you seen the way the French police treat people on, on the coast? Well, in the, in the camps. But anyway, if they don't we, we haven't heard well, they'll on this get badly yet. treated. Um, let, no let's just that. introduce something that Njambi alluded to mm. here. Um, ben in Brighton says, how can a country which the UK accepts asylum claims from ever be considered a safe country? Yeah, there, there are a handful of people who Britain have accepted asylum claims from, from Rwanda, for the political reasons that Njambi has just alluded to. And so I find it difficult to believe that that's a safe, that this is a signal of a safe country. And in some ways, after the Supreme Court ruling, part of the government's response to that was, well, we'll just unilaterally declare by law that they are a safe country, something that a lot of justices in this country, including uh, people like Jonathan Sumption, were very against, because you can't just unilaterally declare that black is white, is what he had said at the time. Um, I think I think fundamentally this, this whole policy was always going to be a sticking plaster. You know, even in the most ideal case for the Conservative Party, it works. We start seeing flights taking off. Are we really saying that's going to clear our backlog of tens, tens of thousands of people coming to seek asylum? No. It was always a symbolic move by, at the time, Boris Johnson, who introduced it, to look like he's doing something. Um, but... You know, I think I think Rishi Sunak's mistake was to continue with it, rather than when he came in and saying, "Clean slate. I'm not. That's not the way I want to deal with this. I want to tackle. I don't know, asylum backlog instead, or how much time people have to spend before they can seek a job as an asylum seeker instead of 12 months, become, cutting that down a bit more so they're not stuck in hotels, just sucking in resources and actually contributing back." Those were not the options that he chose because he was trying to appeal to the right of the party, but unfortunately that's given him a stick for his own back. Well, that's what happens if you make Sola Braverman Home Secretary, I suppose, <laughs> doesn't it? Uh, everything has its consequence. Uh, we'll move on to other questions in just a moment here on Cross Question. It's half past eight. Let's get the latest news headlines from Josh Bancroft. It's been suggested that a leadership challenge against the Prime Minister could trigger a general election. There are reports a group of backbench MPs want to replace Rishi Sunak with Commons leader Penny Mordaunt. The Prime Minister himself has said he's not paying attention to Westminster politics. MPs are again voting on the government's Rwanda bill this evening. The Lords have made ten amendments at which the government are opposing. And Dame Laura Kenny has told LBC she's swapping cycling for parenting, Britain's most decorated female Olympian has announced her retirement from the sport at the age of 31. LBC weather. Showers in the far west moving eastwards tonight, largely dry in the southeast, a low of 7. This is LBC.
8.34 on LBC. Uh, when we first started doing Cross Question about, what, five or six years ago, I seriously suggested that um, a reward for watching us on Global Player would be that you could listen to our discussions in the breaks as well. <laughs> the, the, the last break, it would have been a good one, wasn't it? We were talking about newsreaders with accents. And um, there were varying views. <laughs> Let me reintroduce my panel. Alexander Downer is here, former Australian Foreign Affairs Minister. He is now Chairman of Policy Exchange. Sundar Waller is the Director of British Future. Cindy Yu is Assistant Editor of The Spectator. And Njambi McGraw has a new book out. I'm going to brandish it again, Rinsing Mukami's Soul. But she's not the only one with a book out because Sundar has one called How to Be a Patriot, Why Love of Country Can End Our Very British Culture War. What motivated you to write this? Well, I'm actually quite optimistic about this country and its ability to navigate these identity debates because that's my experience, actually. If you were on the football terrace in the 1980s, if you graduated from university in the 1990s, I saw this country change for the better for people like me. But oh, everyone's at each other's throats now. Mm. Brexit, Scotland, immigration, integration, race, Gaza, and so on. So I'm just trying to persuade everyone we can put it all back together again. Well, I'm really glad that you, you, you say that because sometimes I think in this country we do ourselves down completely needlessly and we are, we are still, as a society, I think much more um, tolerant, diverse, whatever words you want to use, than, than most sort of, of our nearest neighbours. And yet we somehow portray ourselves as being deeply divided, sort of a bit racist and all, all the rest of it. And, OK, some of the headlines in the news, you can't avoid coming to conclusions like that sometimes, but you're putting a different point of view forward. Yeah, and, um, you know, I can't persuade people born 25 years after me that this is true because actually the progress that happened in my lifetime is real, but expectations rose faster. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm fine for expectations rose faster. People say, son, I'm not giving you a lap of honour because they're not throwing bananas at footballers anymore. You know, we'll take that for granted. <laughs> or, you know, I graduated in a country there'd never been an Asian or black government minister ever mm -hmm. in this country. So to me, to have a Welsh first minister, a Scottish first minister, a British prime minister, all Asian and black, uh, Muslim and so on, it feels like quite a lot. My dad thinks it's amazing. My kids are like, well, hasn't that happened before? Why did that take so long? Yeah. So, you know, so there's a, that expectation shift is interesting. And, um, you yeah, know, we should respect that. But but we've got to work out so where we're going. Northern here. Ireland is the outlier at the moment. <laughs> Mind you, with the Sinn Féin first minister, yeah. I mean, that, who would have thought that mm. even 10 years ago? Right, let's go to another question. It's uh, Graham in Hampton. Graham, hello. What would you like to ask? Good evening, everyone. Um, with so many parties and world leaders calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, many not even linking it to hostage release, can the panel explain what this immediate ceasefire would look like and, if implemented, how would it stop Hamas repeating October 7? Alexander. Well, it's an excellent question, and you're completely right with your question. Of course, if you had a ceasefire right now and allowed Hamas, um, I mean, they've been substantially degraded, but uh, uh, allow Hamas to remain in place, uh, then after a short period of time, the rockets and the violence would all start again and the hostages would remain. Um, so an immediate ceasefire, sadly, is not the solution to the problem. And we have to look for a solution to the problem. So a, a sort of hard fascist organisation like Hamas has to have its military capacity destroyed once that's happened, it might be possible to start talking about negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But for as long as a body like Hamas remains uh, in power in Gaza and attacking the Israelis, um, you'll never have peace. And by the way, you'd have a ceasefire tomorrow if Hamas said that they would um, lay down their weapons and surrender the hostages, but they won't do that. And so the war goes on until they're defeated. And Jambi? I mean, the collateral damage is just incredible. Um, every time I watch the news, is heartbreaking. Seeing innocent babies, seeing innocent women. Why can't um, the world just get behind um, some sort of resolution that doesn't mean all these deaths. Um, too many people have, have died and all we want to stop is to see the deaths of people. I don't know that it's too much to ask that we don't see 
any more innocent children, any more innocent people dying. Uh, and then but, but people what? can sit round the table and talk about a solution that works for both. Um, you know, just uh, Gaza is at the point of famine with two million people on the verge of famine. I, I can't see how much more that population can take. And, and I understand that you know, there's an issue. Nobody, I think everybody understands that. But why can't we stop the deaths and then talk, talk about a solution? In any other country, any other countries, if France and Germany were fighting, people would say, please stop the war. Let's try and find a solution. But here you've got a non-state actor which is one of the main competents, and it's quite difficult to see... I mean, even if there were a ceasefire, nobody's suggesting that the Israelis could ever sit down and negotiate with Hamas, quite understandably, given what happened on October the 7th. Mm -hmm. And yet, you have country after country, whether it's in the West or elsewhere, calling for a ceasefire, which they know cannot happen. They're doing it, of course, for domestic political exactly. reasons. That's what's driving it, because, um, I mean... It's quite right. Um, it's it's tragic what's happening to the Palestinian people. But if Hamas cared about the Palestinian people in Gaza, they would lay down their arms and release the hostages, and the war would stop. But and it could it it could be finished by lunchtime tomorrow if Hamas did that. But Hamas won't do that. Hamas want to continue fighting building their tunnels, attacking the Israelis, firing rockets into Tel Aviv and so on. They want to continue to do that. And for as long as they do that, they will be subject okay, to retaliation from the Israelis. Alexander, I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, but I think the thing about Gaza is also about the West Bank, in the sense that if the Israeli government cared about the civilians in Gaza and wanted to show Palestinians as another way forward, that's not Hamas, then they should be supporting the West Bank and making the West Bank into much more of a success story than it is right now. But what we've seen, unfortunately, under Netanyahu's government in the last few years is a lot of encroachment of the West Bank, um, where it's run by the Palestinian Authority, and even in the war since October 7th, a lot of that violence has spilled over into the West Bank. So I think, yes, I agree. A ceasefire cannot happen unilaterally. The hostages must be returned and it's very difficult for Israel to negotiate with Hamas. But the Israeli government also needs to show the Palestinians that there is a way forward to coexist with Israel. And to do that, West Bank, the West Bank will be a perfect way to demonstrate their goodwill or, or their, their willingness to coexist but they're not doing that because of domestic reasons in Israel. And, and also for domestic reasons in Israel, Netanyahu hasn't been prioritising the hostages. He has been offered deals to return the hostages, not all of them, but, but many of them, if he would accept certain uh, conditions, such as returning Palestinian prisoners of war. No, I agree. I agree, Alexander. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a high price. But I think for the families of those hostages... <laughs> yeah, know, it's well, not a... so, so you're telling the Palestinians, if, if you ever get into trouble with the Israelis, take a few more hostages and the Israelis will give in to you. This is not the right strategy for the Israeli government and it's not one they will ever pursue. But I think we can you can get rid of Netanyahu, Netanyahu and put in Benny Gant or someone like that. It's not going to change. The situation will be the same. Hamas need to learn that if there will be peace if they stop attacking Israel and taking Israelis hostage. If they keep doing it, the war will continue. But it's not in their DNA to accept anything like that, is it? That, that's, no. That's the problem, Sunder. Well, I, th I think we've seen, you know, we've seen two unspeakable tragedies play out. What happens on October the 7th, it's, it's a massacre, it's a pogrom of people because, because they're Jewish. Uh, and because they're Israeli, the scale of civilian death in Gaza is a tragedy, the scale of humanitarian need. I think the irony about the British debate about this, which has been very, very heated, is whatever we say and do and pass emotions, you know, the amount of influence we have over Hamas or indeed over Netanyahu is very limited. There's actually a very broad consensus in the parliament and in the country about things that would be good. Give back the hostages, let the aid in, sit down, have a two-state solution, you know, agree on all the good things we'd like to see. The power to bring that about, David Cameron's working very hard, 
wanted to. He's got essentially the same policy as the Labour Party is, is very limited. In the meantime, what we've got responsibility for is the heat and temperature in British society, about how we handle this, how we live together in universities, in classrooms, in workplaces, and so on. You know, we can be part of the solution of aid and diplomacy when it when it's open but we've also got to handle how we handle differences about this about this here so all of this politics about it in a country that broadly is on the side of you know peace justice and a two-state solution but is incredibly limited really in our ability to bring that about in the world Right, we are going to go to a break and then we've got time. I'm going to, my challenge is to fit three questions into the next segment before we finish at nine. It's 8.45. This is LBC.
Alexander Downer, Sunder Wallace, Cindy Yu and Njampi McGraw with us answering your questions. Here's a text question from Vaz, who says, Over the weekend, Vladimir Putin shocked and surprised pollsters by managing, <laughs> by managing to clinch a third consecutive victory at the Russian presidential elections. I kid. Uh, what should the global West be doing to ensure that Ukrainians who wish to be able to elect leaders of their choice maintain that right and maintain it well into the future? Sunda. Well, I think, you know, the war in Ukraine is, is going to be a very long run out thing. We're obviously showing solidarity to the Ukrainians. I think we've got to say that, you know, all the Ukrainians here should be able to be here as long as they need to be here, as long as they're safe. And then we've got to, you know, maintain the pressure. I think it's impressive, I think, the level of public support and public commitment that we've seen. I think a lot of people thought that would that would fragment away much more easily. I think I think Vladimir Putin's view is that we all have very, very short attention spans and are very easily mm. distracted and will move on to something else and if he just stays there and stays there we will all give up and I suppose it's up to us to find out if that's the case or not. What did you make of um, President Macron suggesting that it might be time to put boots on the ground in Ukraine? Well, um, you know, that's for the French army, I think. To <laughs> well, no, but it anyway. would have to be an international I think, effort, I think, yeah, I think, I think, I think he was just trying to signal. He's also been the leader closest to Russia in many ways in terms of trying to have diplomatic channels open. So it was interesting that he chose to be so, you know, almost extravagant in his language about that. I think it's a signalling exercise, really, about, about you know, what, what message he wants to send to the Kremlin. Um, did, did you have any dealings with Putin in your time as foreign minister? I did, yes. I've met um, President Putin um, from time to time. Quiet man, occasionally makes jokes. Um, Funny ones? Did you laugh? Yeah, well, you have to, you have to laugh. <laughs> you live in fear of your life. If you knock, don't laugh. knock. <laughs> um, I mean, I, my, my dealings with him were in, in the context of the Indo-Pacific region. But but I would, I would make this point... Um, I, d I think the British government has done an excellent job in supporting Ukraine. I mean, that is one thing they've done really well, and they've shown real leadership. Um, America has done well until recently, and now there's a flagging of support for Ukraine in the United States, and I think that's very dangerous. I think President Biden um, should redouble his efforts and try to get the Congress to redouble their efforts to support But it's the Republicans Ukraine. who are thwarting them, isn't Some it? Some Republicans, not all Republicans. So the majority is still there in both houses of Congress. But you know what I worry about? In when um, If, if uh, President Trump is re-elected, what will that mean for American support for Ukraine? Mm. And the Europeans tell me they will continue to support Ukraine, but, you know, Europe doesn't have the military capacity that the United States has and it won't be able to build that up between now and the beginning of next year. Cindy? Yeah, increasingly I've been hearing from people in the foreign policy world in D.C. of this theory that if and when Trump comes, he'll be pushing this this perspective of Europe to fight Ukraine to fight Russia in Ukraine, and America freed up resources to go pivot towards Indo-Pacific in case China makes a move on Taiwan. So I think Alexander is definitely right about Trump coming in, and I, I think even if it, he doesn't withdraw American troops from Ukraine, um, there will be. Um, a cut of resources going there. And I think Europe will have to step up much more for, for, for the question that Vaz is asking to, to support Ukrainians. And I think the sad thing is, actually, that some Ukrainians have already lost that right when you look at the occupied territories who, over the weekend, did have to go to the polls uh, and did reportedly return these overwhelming majorities for President Putin because they're under Russian occupation. So whether or not those territories can ever be gotten back, I think is a much less optimistic prospect. And Jambi? How about we lower the temperature a little bit? <laughs> you know, we I'm a pacifist, by the way. I don't know if you can already tell. Uh, but all this, um, you know, at the end of the day, Ukrainians are losing their lives. <laughs> you know, there are so many, and there is not even... They've had their country invaded. What do you think they should have done, just not fought back? Well, yes, they, they should fight back, but, I mean, we are all arming people to just carry on fighting, and I think good allies should, you know, broker peace, be, uh, you know, agents of brokering peace, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, Europe is depleting all of its armory, America is depleting all of its armory, and you've seen the big struggle to get the funding going in America, because in America they have an opioid crisis, 
crisis, 21 million in opiate addiction. You have crumbling structures in the United States and people are thinking, and, and then they have their crisis on the border with Mexico and they're thinking how much more can we support a war whilst our own structures are absolutely on, on their knees. You know, people in these countries are actually really struggling and uh, the focus is trying to, to keep a war going. How about perhaps maybe we find a way of, of uh, brokering peace and I don't know, you know, Russia has, has its ambitions, you know, the whole, you know, West has have their ambitions and I suppose, you know, we can find peace. If we found peace with Northern Ireland, we can find peace with anybody. Uh, and uh, perhaps lowering... <laughs> We're not involved perhaps, in this negotiation, I, I know, unfortunately. But, well, well, the thing is, for a very long time, uh, the West have actually found a way of living uh, peacefully with Putin. <laughs> and somehow in the last few years, the um, the temperature has gone up and up and up. And uh, and I don't seem to... That's to not remember. the West's fault. That's no, Putin's fault. No, fair enough, because they've got their territory that they have to fight for. And I'm not pro-Russia, by the way. I am not, absolutely. But I'd, um, I remember Russia being uh, in war with Chechnya. Uh, we, we, we weren't supporting Chechnya or all of that stuff. And so I'm uh, surprised by how much we've gone for Ukraine and we didn't do a great deal for Chechnya. What is it about Ukraine that I'm we... I'm sure you can compare the two. Chechnya, oh, is, <laughs> Chechnya is part of Russia. Yeah. Which Ukraine wasn't. Uh, which well, Ukraine? Well, it was part of the Soviet it, it, Union, yeah. but not, yeah, it's not. not part of Anyway, Russia. listen, I want to get one more question in. Right. Um, we could go on about that for a very long time. Let's go to Ravin in Croydon. Uh, Ravin, what would you like to ask? Yeah. Um, last week, Kemi Badenoch, um came out and condemned or said that Frank Hester's comments were racist. The fact that today she's now reeling back and calling it trivi trivia, does that ultimately demonstrate that conserv black and ethnic minority conservative MPs are afraid to meaningfully confront racism? <laughs> I think we did talk about this in the last hour, and the, the trivia comment, I think, was based on the fact that it had been go this story dominated the news agenda for several days now, and she thought that it had been reduced to trivia in terms of like, oh, well, we're now talking about should the money be sent back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That, that was my interpretation of it anyway. Cindy? Yeah, I agree. I think it's a consistent view from Kemi. Sorry, Ravin. <laughs> um, in the sense that, you know, as one of the only black um, cabinet ministers, she is able to talk about racism in a more confident way than her non, uh, I don't know, non BAME or white uh, peers. We're not allowed to say BAME. I, know, I, I actually really hate the term BAME. That's why I stopped saying <laughs> <laughs> um, But. You know, she's also right to call it trivia. We've been focused on the story for all, more than a week now. It's Of course, it's a lot of money. Of course, the comments were abhorrent. But, you know, there are so many more important and really real issues. If, we're to, if we care about racism, there are many more racist inequalities in this country that we should be tackling in real life than someone's private comments they made, not even, you know, in a public sphere. So I, I think, I do think okay. her, her position is consistent. I mean, and Jamie, it seemed to me that had she not come out and called those comments racist, last week. Um, Rishi Sunak may well have not done so because they put ministers up on the TV and they were essentially instructed not to call the comments racist. Yeah, I mean... It's almost That's as though the second time you've sighed. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there's, there's just so much uh, here because uh, uh, what uh, Frank Hester said is dangerous for black women. We are already very marginalised, and uh, for them to put uh, Kemi, I don't know whether she volunteered to go uh, forward and say this is, you know, it's trivia. It's not trivia. Uh, when Frank Hester is calling for uh, saying how much he hates black women and Diana about should be shot, and we already know that politicians are being killed. This is dangerous. This is not just a fun. This is not rhetoric. And uh, the, the using of people who look a certain way to try and diffuse such a row is completely unfair and unfortunate because racism is is dangerous to this. In, to any okay. country, it's quite dangerous. Now, we're running out of time, so I'm going to get brief answers, Alexander and then Sunder. Well, I think, you know, everything that's been said about this has been said. It was a private conversation. It was published on the front of a newspaper. Um, well, it wasn't a private conversation at all. He was in front of other people. Yeah, but it was in a private setting, as well, I understand. It's nothing's ever private. Place. Well, I mean, I don't know the guy. I don't know. Position, who, I'm just making the point <laughs> that that it was. It, it ended up on the front of a newspaper. Uh, it's been debated for days. Everybody said everything you could possibly no. say about it, and I think, um, you know, I think the public 
expect politicians to focus on issues that really directly affect them. Well, this and affects, I think this directly affects. affects. And I think, I know, I think this well. is, it's been commented on. Well. People did comment on it. And I think it's, you know, probably reaching okay. exhaustion. You can't move on from a debate until you answer the questions. I'm in favour, actually, of rehabilitating people who apologise. The Conservatives telling us this man has apologised. He said his comments had nothing to do with her race or her gender, which everyone can tell is completely untrue. Kemi Badnock did well the first time, I think. It shouldn't, white Conservatives shouldn't leave it to black Conservatives and Muslim Conservatives to tell them what prejudice is, but it's helpful that they're there. But they need to, if, if he wants to apologise for racism, he should do so. If he's going to say nothing he said was racist, then I think he shouldn't have standing as a as a person in and around the Conservative Party as a party donor. Right, our final question comes from Alfie in Berwick-upon-Tweed. A new series of special 50p coins features some of the spaceships from Star Wars. Oh my God, have we been reduced to this? <laughs> Who or what would you com commemorate on a coin? Well, I'll give you a couple of moments to think. I would do a series of coins featuring every single of the 57 British Prime Ministers. Because that's what should be on coins, not wretched spaceships. Am I not right, Ms. Trust. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I, oh, <laughs> OK, possible one or two exceptions. Uh, well, I think actually Diana Abbott should be on one, being the first black female MP. And I think she's played such a, uh, an amazing role and a role model for a, a lot of young black women who've seen that she has been in there for uh, such a long time and she's been very influential to many black people. I, I have no difficulty in saying I'd rather see Diana Abbott on a coin than a spaceship. <laughs> Alexander. I think um, it's a good point. I think Margaret Thatcher as the first woman Prime Minister should be on a coin and Rishi Sunak as the first Asian, ethnically Asian Prime Minister should also be on a coin. I think that would be a good way of doing and it. And the Labour Party Jewish could have one. its coin the Labour Party could have its coin when it chooses a leader who fits into either of those categories. Sunday. That sounds like many years into the future. <laughs> I, I won a campaign for coin because we had the Windrush, better ship than the Star Wars ships, or for the 75th yep. anniversary. And so what I would have is uh, I would have Viv Anderson, the footballer, the first black player to play for England in 1978. When we host the Euros, after we win them this summer, we host them in four years' time, it'll be the 50th anniversary oh. of Viv Anderson being the first well, black really? English footballer. That's a series. I, I remember that. Him, <laughs> we should put him on a coin and mark how important that progress is. I remember okay. the days when West Ham had two black players in the early 1970s. I just say that for information purposes. <laughs> Cindy. Yeah, my mind went away from politics, actually. More, I was thinking Amy Winehouse as someone who was just so representative of a zeitgeist. So you're making a, such a face at me right now, Ian, for people listening on the radio. This is Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? You know, yes, she was such a huge that. talent. She was so representative of a certain zeitgeist in the UK. Um, and... Why not? Why should it always be politics or some kind of greater theme? Why can't it just be something that... T touches every part of people's lives, so it's just music. If you said Anietta Feltzkog, I'd have been absolutely in support. Um, thank you very much to all four of you for joining us for this hour. Alexander Downer, Sundar Katwala, Cindy Yu and Njambi McGrath. On tomorrow's panel, we have the Conservative Minister for Common Sense, Esther McVeigh, uh, the SNP's Home Affairs spokesperson, Alison Thewlis, the political commentator, Matthew Hulbert, and the non-affiliated peer, Kate Hoey. Coming up in the next hour on LBC, um, did you go to a boarding school? Or if you're a parent, have you considered sending your kids to a boarding school? To me, sending a child to boarding school is tantamount to child abuse. And Charles Spencer, Lord Spencer, has revealed today that he was, what, well, revealed over the weekend, he was sexually abused as a child in a boarding school. Now, that's not to say that every kid that goes to a boarding school is abused. But I just wonder what is in the mentality of parents who think, well, let's have some children and then ship them off for most of the year to a boarding school. What effect does it have on you later in life? What effect does it have... Uh, Alexander Downer is holding his head in his hands. Did you go to a boarding school? I did. Right, you can stay on as our first guest. <laughs> 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 9 o'clock.
Conservative MPs have been urged to back the Prime Minister amid renewed speculation of a leadership challenge. It's reported Penny Mordaunt has been suggested as a replacement for Rishi Sunak by a group of MPs. Cindy Yu is the assistant editor of The Spectator magazine. She's told Ian Dale a lot of backbenchers have had enough. It's a thorough mess and if you talk to Conservative MPs, they're exhausted actually. 62 of them have already said that they want to be stepping down in the next election. Many more are just tired of the never-ending psychodrama and the problems that are coming up in the country. The Prime Minister himself has said he isn't paying attention to Westminster politics. MPs are voting on the government's Rwanda bill this evening. The Lords have sent it back to the Commons with 10 amendments, all of which the governments oppose. 200 steel workers in Port Talbot are facing uncertainty over the immediate future of their jobs. Tata Steel has announced it will close the coke ovens this week, three months earlier than planned, over concerns about their operational stability. The UN Food Agency says shortages in areas of Gaza are already past famine levels. Israel is insisting aid is being allowed in, but that it's been stolen by Hamas. A college student from Merseyside who wrote a how-to terror guide on using weapons and bombs has been jailed for 13 years. 20-year-old Jacob Graham made videos and spoke about going on a rampage. Detective Superintendent Andy Meeks led the investigation. We think his actions were motivated by a hatred of government, the government's ability to kind of repress individuals. So rather than any specific political parties or any specific politicians, it was more around the general concept of government. And Dame Laura Kenny has told LBC she wants to focus on being...